Hello Retro Gamers and welcome back to Retro Game On. Today we're taking a look at Vortex, developed by Argonaut Software and released by Electrobrain on the SNES in 1994. This 3D mech shooter has been sitting in my collection for a while now, but what really spurred me to review it was a recent article about it in issue 147 of Retro Gamer. Being a Super FX game makes it more interesting to look into over all the other riffraff anyway, but the article reveals a few other interesting things of note. For one, the long-held belief that this was created from the ashes of a Transformers game is false. What actually went down is that this and the Transformers game were being developed in tandem, with the letter eventually being cancelled and then ruined by Michael Bay. So yes, history, but enough of the lesson, let's get on with the review. God, it's hot. <laughs> Super FX games. Super FX games never change. Huh? What? Sorry, I'm having a really hard time getting off the Fallout 4 hype tram. Vortex's story doesn't seem that complicated on the surface, but there's so many long names with questionable pronunciation, I never really had any idea what was going on. But, in classic mid-90s Nintendo fashion, there are bad guys who have stolen things from good guys, and you're in a transformable mech to save the day. But hey, whoever played Super FX games for their stories? You take control of the morphing battle system, which can transform between a walker, aptly called the walker, a wheeled vehicle called the land burner, an aircraft called the sonic jet, and lastly the hard shell, which is more or less the same as curling up into a ball as you're being mugged. First impressions of Vortex were good, as there is a neato interactive tutorial. It soon becomes apparent just how important this is though, since at first glance, and probably the last glance, that the control scheme is hugely convoluted. I don't think I ever got a hang of the controls, which was a huge part as to why I had so much trouble with this game. The SNES's controller isn't exactly suited for a full-on mech simulator, which is what the developers were seemingly aiming for. I can see this problem dissolving after repeated play when you get used to it, but it made the learning curve quite steep. There are a few additional quirks that makes it even more difficult again too. For one, if you push forward or backwards, the mech will infinitely walk in that direction until you tell it to stop with a few different levels of speed. In the heat of combat, I found this to lessen my ability to move as freely as I would have liked, and I feel that the game would have benefited without it. Furthermore, since the game was pushing the limits of graphics and all that at the time, it suffers from quite a bit of input lag with slowdown if there are a lot of enemies on screen. Couple this with a jump that takes you halfway across the map, and the main problem is that I just never really felt in full control. If you get over the complex controls, input lag and continuous slowdown though, you'll find there is a game here with some wonderful ideas, but a bloody hard one at that. I know there will be at least one noble internet commentator who will state that this game was no biggie, they had no problems, and I'm a wuss, blah blah blah, but I don't care. This game broke me. If the ever resilient and plentiful enemies weren't enough, there is just factor on top of factor that contributes to making Vortex difficult. As I said, controlling the mech alone can be laborious with the control scheme and the game chugging along, but sometimes the environment itself actively contributes and works against you too. Some factors can be forgiven since it was such an early 3D game, like infrequent clipping on some geometry, but other times the game just overwhelms you. The enemies spawn out of nowhere and constantly ambush you. I guess they're a part of a good army, if anything, but a lot of times I found myself staring at a stupidly busy screen. Enemies are suddenly everywhere, and they all merge into the environment thanks to the limited colour palette that would have been available, making it hard to see what you're exactly shooting at. Another technical factor working against them is the draw distance too, which really makes the enemies pop out of nowhere. It's hard to put down the game for that though since it was so early in the 3D generation, but it hampers gameplay nonetheless. The developers seem to have been self-aware of these issues though, and to their merit did try to make the game easier to play. For one, auto-targeting as enabled by default really goes a long way in helping you shoot things. The actual weapons themselves are quite powerful too, meaning that even though enemies will pop out of nowhere and surround you in a matter of seconds, they are very easy to dispose of. The levels are quite large too. This would be a disadvantage thanks to the graphics, making the environments all look the same, thus making it super easy to get lost in, if it wasn't for the interactive maps. These can be accessed at the push of a button and show where you and your objectives are in real time. If you ever try this game, I recommend checking your maps regularly. Without them, you'll spend most of this game roaming around clueless. The developers really went a long way in variating the gameplay, and it's obvious they wanted to make full potential of the 3D environments. The first level plays out like Star Fox, and is best played in the jet as you fly through a space corridor of sorts, blasting everything in your path. 
Beyond that though, most levels are on planets, as you stomp or drive around the landscape attacking enemies and picking up whatever you need to pick up to progress the storyline. There can be small puzzles to solve too, and while these are usually simple enough, they can be a pain in the ass to solve, as plenty of enemies will seek you out and constantly attack you as you try to do so. On these levels you can also go down elevators into underground areas, and the game will turn into a first person corridor shooter. These are pretty great for the most part, as there are minimal enemies, but instead loads of platforming elements instead. Unfortunately, the mech does have quite a large turning arc though, which can make traversing 90 degree turns difficult. Lastly, there is a racing level of sorts, where you have to get to the end before the timer runs out. Over that, you can only use a jet for limited bursts, thanks to the gravity. This would be a great level for the ground vehicle if it wasn't for the short draw distance and enormous jumps though. There are gaps that must be jumped over and will appear out of nowhere, and when you do jump, they take you quite a distance. Not an impossible level by any means, but I feel that some gameplay tweaking and balancing would have taken it to its full potential. Being that this is a Super FX game, obviously the graphics are going to be a major point of discussion. 3D graphics from the Wild West era of 3D games have always fascinated me, especially on the SNES, as it was traditionally a 16-bit console. In that article I read in Retro Gamer, it was stated that only a few hundred polygons could be rendered on screen at any one time. It's amazing that workable games were being developed at all with such limited resources. It all squeezed onto a 4 megabyte cartridge too. Even if this isn't the most perfect game ever, it's still a playable game nonetheless, so color me impressed. The background illustrations are fantastic too. I know these literally fade into the background of all the 3D on display, but they're worth taking a look at as they're quite well drawn. Continuing on the technology front, Vortex supports Dolby Surround, which is nice for a SNES game. The in-game music thumps along quite acceptably and sounds brilliant on my speaker setup for my retro games. As for my final opinion, I'm actually quite conflicted. It's not exactly just a glorified tech demo, but it's not quite a fantastic game either. Vortex as a whole is an interesting concept full of plenty of varied gameplay, as well as great graphics and sound. It does get let down by its unrelentless difficulty though, as well as its complex and sometimes unresponsive controls. A through all shortcomings though, I definitely think this game could be enjoyable if you can get your head around the controls and don't mind an extreme challenge. It's probably worth finding if you like collecting Super FX games too. Hello Retro Gamers and thank you so much for watching, especially after such a large break. It's been nearly two months since I last uploaded a review, which I find to be quite disappointing. Never fear though, as nasty exams are over. And I do mean they were nasty, I had 11 of the bastards. Now I have free time though, and you better believe I'll be pumping the videos out. I've even already started playing the next game for review as I'm typing the script. Exciting times. Thank you again so much for sticking with me though, and I'll catch you next time.